So, hi, I'm here with Cassie Quinn, founder of CQ Studios, which is a regenerative fashion lab. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today in this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Um, so let's begin by talking a little bit about yourself and your process in uh, with textiles. Like, how did all this journey begin? Yeah, so um, CQ Studio is a regenerative uh, textiles lab, and it really began um, during my bachelor's degree. So I started to you know research into fast fashion. Um, it was a module that we had to study and realized how toxic uh, the fashion industry was and that there was a lot of waste being produced. I trained originally as a print designer um, and in the print and dye room, there's a lot of you know toxic chemicals, a lot of waste water, um, and yeah, just a lot of different processes that can be problematic. And so I wanted to search for solutions to my own um, design um, problems I was having. Originally, I wanted to be a fashion designer and, you know, encountering these problems made me realize that actually focusing on developing new and innovative but also interesting um, new materials was really um, quite key so I kind of shifted my my goals um, and then decided to find the company CQ Studio during my master's in biodesign from Central St. Martins. That's amazing. Um, I recall that you mentioned that you felt a little bit frustrating with the, all this greenwashing in the fashion industry. Is this what inspired you to to start CQ Studios or how did it come to life? Yeah, so it was during my master's degree and um, when I was developing different products and different materials, um, you know, there could be quite complexity uh, around the actual process of making, you know, taking something from a plant uh, right through to a fabric and then into a design garment. Um, and, you know, the messaging can really get lost and through some of the research I was doing and some of the um, solutions I was looking at using for my own designs, I really felt frustrated that, you know, there seemed to be this um, miscommunication as to, you know, the sustainability, the environmental impacts. And, and so I really wanted to set out with CQ Studio to be as transparent, um, but also innovative um, and exciting. That's the real main focus that we've got is if we really want designers to switch to these better solutions, we have to make it exciting and we have to make it enticing. And so that's why we really focus a lot on making things that are colorful, that are attractive, you know, that are more valuable um, when you use waste rather than simply having to jeopardize your design to be sustainable. Yeah, I see a lot of color in all of your projects. I love it. Um... I mean, uh, I wanted to ask you, what is the impact of combining biology and design in the fashion and textile industry? I think the main thing with, you know, looking at these different systems is that that is the that, that is life, essentially. We're all interconnected. So what we do has an impact on other, you know, biodiversity. So we should also think about how when we design that we can use and work in collaboration with, bio, um, with biology in order to be more sustainable. If we do that from the source, it means that the impact after life will um, you know, have a better you know, or less impact on the environment. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's really crucial that we do actually think about how we can collaborate with biology, with nature throughout the design process. That's amazing. I love this holistic uh, thinking that you have in your, your studio. I love it that we have to that you give us this proposal of start to think in a way that we collaborate with earth and we start um doing things and that go around you know like helping instead of just making it worse i love it um how has the industry responded to your proposal have you seen like an increase of interest in developing new bio designs for collections yeah, I mean, yes, the response has been really incredible. Um, we've been so grateful. You know, a lot of designers, a lot of companies and brands are really keen to work with us. You know, the one issue is always about scale. Um, you know, industry as with demands in, in the current moment, we aren't quite ready for that. And a lot of these new innovations and next-gen materials aren't there. So it really is about, you know, making sure that the message, making sure the communication with us as the material developers and those brands and then the consumer is very clear because it is going to be a work in progress, but we have to do it. You know, we have to take these steps. We can't wait until the material is perfect or that the process is perfect because it's going to be too late. 
So um, it is really good because there's a lot of people that really want to work on this, but at the same time, it's starting to adjust our expectations as to, you know, how quickly it's going to be on the shop floors, how quickly we'll be able to get that, you know, the process and the business model really done. Um, but the interest has been there and it's really exciting. Um, one thing for us, again, is trying to really make sure that our message is clear and, you know, that we aren't mis, um, misinterpreting what we're doing to the consumer and to the brands that we work with. So trying to take, you know, when you're working on a project so closely, you think that people know what it is um, yeah. and you make those assumptions. And you know, trying to understand, okay, what would be the key thing that people don't understand, and how do we make sure that that's communicated effectively? So it's you know, it's a constant progress, you know, and it's constantly working on refining things. But it's an exciting journey. That's amazing. I love it that a lot of people are are really interested in that. I love that you say uh, we have to start somewhere. I mean, we cannot wait until things get worse or, okay, now we need a solution. We have to start working on them. And yeah. I know that you encourage people and yeah. young designers, especially to start with this. Even if it's not perfect, we need to yeah. start. I mean, there was a really interesting post that I saw and it said that, you know, in this study that they'd done with designers, almost 100% of them were afraid to even touch anything sustainable because they were worried of being called out for, you know, potentially having a negative impact. And that's the real issue we've got to deal with is we got to stop judging companies and brands and designers who are trying. You know, it's different calling out brands who aren't trying and they don't care, but there is a lot of, you know, uh, issues around, you know, immediately calling someone out because they got it wrong. I mm. mean, we're all learning. This is all a learning process and we should be encouraging people to, you know, try as long as you go in with your best intentions. You know, that's the main thing. And that's the real, um, that's the crux of what we need to focus on. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, could you guide us through the steps that are involved in developing new materials? Uh, where do you usually start and where do you get inspiration from? Yeah, so with me, I start with a problem. So, you know, I'll usually start a project looking at, you know, a particular waste issue or a particular, um, you know, material that's causing a lot of damage, but it's always starting with a problem. It's not necessarily starting with, oh, I want to design a new leather or I want to design a new product because that kind of comes after, you know, when we talk about regenerative design, we have to look at starting from the point of where our impacts are and, and then designing from that point. So it means that actually the designed outcome might be different than you know what you first or initially had in mind because it's focusing on what's being infected, what's being impacted, where is the issue, how do we resolve that and then create design from that. And that's the real beauty of it is it's a very explorative, it's very experimental. Sometimes, in fact, most of the times things won't work and they won't go as you thought might they might have went. Um, but that's what's really exciting about it is that it's so challenging. And I think that that's, you know, what we really should be doing. I think the big issue of how we've got into this situation with the fashion industry where there's a lot of disposable um, garments is that we haven't really focused on the energy that comes from designing from the problem. You know, yeah. it's just, it's quick to make this these t-shirts that are disposable. But if we start looking at the problem and we challenge ourselves that we design that way, it gives it a lot more meaning and it gives it a lot more purpose. And that's really important. Um, and then from that, when you've got your, your problem, you're focused on, it's real about experimenting. Um, and for me, I like to apply lots of traditional crafts to these next gen materials yeah. so that it isn't just fully, you know, solely focused on technology and right. new innovations. It really is how we bring the past with the future um, and combine these new technologies with traditional crafts so that we can you know, create something really interesting. That's amazing. Incorporating the craftsmanship with the technology, I think it's the future for sure. Um, Accessorize uh, is one of our favorite projects of yours. This, I, I think you work on it on your MA at Central St. Martins. How was it working in it and developing all these new um accessorize uh alternatives yeah i mean it was incredible it was you know a part of maison zero for the i use um lvmh's so that's the lvmh group um within csm mm -hmm. um and it was for the iucm conference which is this massive biodiversity conference that happens every year um, mm -hmm. and so that was real honor to design it for that but the actual process of making it was very frustrating <laughs> to say the <laughs> least 
it didn't work for like nine months it really took a long time to get the process to work um but it was a real you know it was really problem solving trying to get down to the you know the root of what was what was happening in that mechanism um but in the end you know when you're driven by that purpose of trying to solve a problem that's really what gives you that that hope in that direction um but yeah it's an incredible i love to really experiment and you know tear things apart and really try and rebuild and create something completely new from what you might you know see the the original source of that material looking like so it was a really exciting project and we're still working on it now mm -hmm. um you know we're trying you know different iterations of that design as well as looking at collaborations with some designers I mean, I think it's incredible. When I first saw it, I was so impressed and I was also very happy to see that you bring to the table these new alternatives. Uh, there's so much microplastic going around the world. So we need these little details that come in garments, uh, they fall off and then they go back to the earth and they don't dissolve. They don't, uh, we're just making it worse. And it's tiny microplastic. Uh, so I think it's... Yeah great that you're bringing these uh, new alternatives can also what are the limitations and issues that come with working with uh, biomaterials so i mean there's a lot of issues because you know when you're working with nature when you're working with biological sources there's a lot of um of, of areas that you know can be problematic when you're trying to scale when you when you have something working like this you know tiny batch lab scale process it's easy to find out what the problems are and you know solve them. But when you start to increase that scale, that size of the material that you're trying to make, it just it's almost like a new project starts. Um, and it really is almost like starting back at zero. Um, not to mention, you know, we don't want to actually manufacture everything in-house. We want to work with manufacturers and trying to find the right manufacturers who not only have the, the machinery or are willing to develop the machinery, but who also have the insurance that covers that. Because yeah. that's one thing that we realized is, you know, we spoke with some manufacturers and they're very hesitant because some of their equipment costs, you know, millions of pounds. If we damage it and that doesn't fall under their insurance, they're, they're in a lot of trouble. That's their livelihood. So trying to figure out the right people to work with in order to make this scaled enough to actually have the impact is very difficult. Um, and also ensuring that that's still circular and sustainable, because as we know, once we start scaling, and we start transporting things, you know, that there's more energy usage, there's, you know, transport, all these things then will impact the actual circularity of that product. Um, and also consider in the post-life, so what actually happens when a consumer is finished. The reason why we were interested in looking at, you know, sequins and uh, embellishments is usually sequins and embellished garments are something you would keep for longer or you know, look after in a different way. So already there is a different use for a consumer on that item, but still it needs to be considered. Um, so yeah, there, there's still limitations. We're trying to work through them. And really the way that we resolve these limitations is by within the network of all of these new, new uh, material innovators, we all speak and collaborate with each other because a lot of the time we're going through some of the same issues. Yeah. And although we're, you know, they're technically competitors, Really, you know, your competitors, um, as long as, you know, your product's always going to be slightly different, but we're really working together in order to overcome these limitations is how we get these these materials actually into products and on the market and, you know, consumers using them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there are so many steps that have to go right and so many little details in order to, to go into this circularity that uh, we're looking for, but I, I feel it's great. Um can you talk to me a little bit about flax? I know you worked also uh, with this fiber already in a project mm -hmm. called Inflaxuation. Um, how can we reintroduce and reincorporate this fiber in the way of making more sustainable fashion? So with the flax project, you know, it really started from my heritage. I'm half Chinese, half Irish. I grew up in Ireland and, you know, flax was a massive industry there. So that's why I was really interested to focus on, you know, flax really all we know of it is as linen. And linen has a very specific quality. You know, it has a specific sort of designed outcome and designers who use that. It, it, it's for a specific use case. I wanted to see, you know, if we want to revive industries, we kind of have to use, show that there's different applications that bring it into the future. And so again, that's that mix of, craft with new technologies again coming through 
Um, but one of the main things for me is when we talk about what's going to what's going to be the materials or what are going to be the materials that solve all of our problems, we always think of next gen. We think of growing. We think of mycelium, bacteria. When really flax is it was one of the oldest fibers that existed before plastic did. Right. So why? Why are we turning our backs on that? Why can't we, you know, try and bring that into the future by using new new processes, new technologies to reinvigorate it, essentially? And so that's what my goal was with that, was to show there's more that we can do with flax. Let's not forget about that. We we also need the mycelium. We need the bacteria. But alongside that, why can't we you know, try and revive flax, which is yeah. such an incredibly sustainable fiber as it is? Exactly. And I, I know that this fiber like thrives with just rainwater and it yeah. also has these properties that it doesn't need um, pesticides or as men, as much as pesticides as yeah. other. So I think this yeah. is a, a great way of reincorporating. Don't know why yeah. we stop using it if it's exactly. And and another thing with the project was actually looking beyond just because the crop itself, yes, it's sustainable, but if it's grown in monoculture it's not going to be sustainable. It's still going to have an impact. I actually found a farm in Ireland called Mallon Linen, and yeah. they are growing flax regeneratively. So regeneratively in a crop rotation that heals the soil as each crop is growing. And so, you know, that's even one step beyond because yeah. through the process of growing this material, you are actually benefiting the soil. Soil is so important to our ecosystems. And that really is the, is the future, is regenerative design, regenerative practices and how we grow our materials for our textiles. Yeah, like we were saying, like there are so many little steps that we have to take into consideration to make it really sustainable or as sustainable as possible to not have this bigger impact um, in, in fashion or in the world in general. Um, so last but not least, uh, how do you see regenerative fashion's um, future and fashion's future? Yeah, I mean, I think regenerative fashion really is the only direction we can go. You know, we are at a point where we've caused a lot of damage, you know, not just the fashion industry, but across all these different industries. Fashion for me, it's such a, you know, we the reason why we need to focus on fashion being regenerative is we need to save fashion. You know, fashion is about expression, it's about fun, it's about, you know, showing your identity. Yeah. And, you know, it has a real purpose, you know, it's an art form and we need to save that. But we have to do it by showing that we can have a positive impact on the planet. You know, I can really see the future of the fashion industry where our clothes have a second life that's beneficial to nature. Yeah. So, you know, our our t-shirts turn into nests for, for birds or, you know, they turn into insect hotels or they turn into fertilizer. You know, we have to think about the whole process of how our, our garments are not just made, but also the afterlife. Yeah. But I think, you know, we are getting there, but we just need to start, we need to start testing things. We need to start putting things on the market and trying to make them happen instead of them just sitting in these, you know, proposed um, projects. Let's actually start, you know, trialing how this would work. Yeah, I mean, fa uh, fashion is going all, always so fast. So if mm -hmm. we are also throwing away clothes that we use for just a, a season or something, what better than these clothes going back to to yeah. Earth and just uh, doing something better? I mean, helping at least, right? Yeah. So, well, thank you so much for this incredible conversation. Uh, it was very enlightening, and I hope this also inspires a lot of young designers and also makes an impact in everybody's life and makes them think how can they start uh, doing something better and also where, and I know that you are also giving workshops. Um, mm -hmm. So I hope they get in contact with you to get more information, also brands. I mean, this would be so helpful for everybody. So. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much.